Well, we'd like to welcome you all to this Sunday, September 25th, 2022, the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. This is Christ the Redeemer, Anglican Church. So now, please stand as we sing our processional hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what the Lord Jesus Christ says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. We give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, 
Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sin and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the first lesson. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalne and see, and from there go to Hamath the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms or is their territory Or is their territory greater than your territory? O you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence? Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flocks and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Please stand for the psalm. Let us read Psalm 146 responsively at the half verse. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Indeed, as long as I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in any child of man. For when one breathes his last, he shall return again to the earth. Blessed is the one who has the God of Jacob for his help. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is therein. Who does right to those who suffer wrong. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord helps those who have fallen. The Lord cares for the strangers in the land. He defends the fatherless and widow. The Lord shall be king forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Do you want me to... A reading from the first epistle to Timothy. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich, as for the rich in this present time, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to, do gen to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel reading. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said that there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you tell us that where two or more 
are gathered together, you are here with us, and we recognize that today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love for us that surpasses everything. It surpasses even the areas that we fail you. We thank you for your instruction and for your discipline and for your forgiveness. In you we have hope and we are eternally grateful for that and may that be expressed in our worship of you every day of our lives and beyond. It is in the most precious and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I've been meeting weekly with a group of young people and we start our time together each week playing games. And doing this has reminded me how much I enjoy playing board games and card games. Gary can attest to this. And we, we like doing that as a family whenever we can and we get quite competitive and it's always funny and fun and sometimes frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> Frustrating, I mean. As a kid, I remember a particular board game um, that we played, or at least I played with my friends, um, based on a popular game show called Password. And the goal of this game is for a team of two to score the most points against another team as one partner of the team guesses a specific word called a password from one word clues that the hinting partner will give. The passwords are printed on a card in blue ink, but each printed password has other words printed over the top of it in red ink in order to obscure or hide the password from plain view. So the hinting partner, though, is provided with a special envelope, and for some reason, I don't know, as a kid, I had a fondness for that envelope. It was just kind of magical, but it's just an envelope. But the envelope had a special frame that was lined with red cellophane, and when the password card was slipped into the envelope, does anybody remember this game? You slip the card into the envelope and the red cellophane blocks out the red printing and the blue password miraculously is revealed. <laughs> so this trip down memory lane is what came to mind, Precur maybe it's peculiar, I can't even say that, when I noticed how the common theme of today's appointed scriptures is obvious when you know the password, but without it one might not be so sure. <laughs> but the layout to, of today's readings provides the keyword of our theme, the password, out front. So I thought, what if we were to read or consider our passages in a different order? How readily could we recognize the password or key thought from them alone? I believe we could, but it might take some coaxing. Thankfully, God's word for us is different. It isn't only revealed to a person who holds a special card. Instead, it's available to all who come to him earnestly seeking to understand his word for us and for our lives. So, let's consider what is the main theme of today's scripture, or one main theme of today's scripture. I won't claim that I have <laughs> just one theme but one that stands out. If we can recognize that, perhaps we'd readily recognize or identify a specific term, the password, when we hear it, and you will hear it toward the end of this message. So let's revisit today's passages, and we're going to begin with Psalm 146. This psalm is the first one of the final five chapters or of individual psalms in the Psalter, and each one of these five begins and ends with an imperative, praise the Lord, or hallelujah in some translations. This particular psalm has inspired the writing of several hymns, including Isaac Watts' I'll Praise My Maker While I've Breath, which reflects the psalmist's commitment to a lifetime of praise. It is worthwhile also to know that the psalm was authored by King David, who is considered the greatest and most revered human kings of Israel. But as mighty and honored as he was, King David did not consider himself above demonstratively 
humbly honoring and extolling the Lord God in word, in writing, and in body. This was the man, after all, who shamelessly danced before the Lord with all his might, even though his wife, Michael, despised seeing him behave in such an undignified manner. You see, Michael, the daughter of King Saul, had been a princess in the United Kingdoms of Israel, or United Kingdom of Israel at that time. She was then wed to David, who then became the king of Judah, and then of Israel. Michael apparently did not like her husband, the king, conducting himself in ways unbefitting of royalty. But her husband, David, remained the same king who would prostrate himself before the Lord in repentance, even in the presence of his own servants. And he would lead assemblies to do the same, paying homage in reverence to the Most High God. David was a man of influence, an example, stewarding his people to be reverent before the Lord God in joy and in lament. So it is safe to guess that David's penning of this psalm was not only for his private times of worship, but also for instructive, with instructive concern for the righteous welfare of God's people. In this, Psalm 146 serves not only as a devotional reflection of David, but as a call to worship for the masses, even for generations yet unseen. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. I will praise him as long as I live. I will praise him with my whole being, declares David the king. And then this prince of princes humbly admonishes others, and perhaps himself. Don't put your trust in princes, for we are each only human, destined to perish, and to fail in our plans. None of us can truly, permanently save. Blessed then is he who places his trust in the Lord, the God who has shown himself to be faithful from generation to generation. For it is the Lord who wondrously created everything around us. It is he who executes justice, who cares for the damaged and suffering. It is he who watches and who intervenes. And it is he who brings the wicked to ruin. It is only he who reigns forever. So praise him with me, declares King David. Praise the Lord. Next we have the instructions of Paul and his mentorship of Timothy. In the fuller context of this letter, we find Paul instructing a young colleague who is in the tough position of addressing and correcting false teaching that was spreading through and within the Ephesian church. And he was to correct the source as well. Timothy is to do this through instructive emphasis on proper beliefs, correct beliefs in the gospel, and on proper Christian conduct and through situational reorganization of the worship leadership structure of that body of believers, all in order to protect others from being led astray. Paul, in this portion of his letter, does two things. First, he directs Timothy to protect the true witness of the gospel of Christ, persevering to uphold righteousness godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. But then Paul zeroes in on the well-to-do adherence of the Ephesian church. If you might recall elsewhere in this letter, it seems that those who are more affluent, who have too much time on their hands, have been used handily as props and mouthpieces for false teaching within the local body. So now here in our reading today, 
Paul directs Timothy to command those with wealth to take on a more humbled sense of themselves, to rehabilitate their pride of wealth and comforts into godly, others-focused benevolence. And this wasn't a passive request. He didn't say, well, if you might find it in your hearts, could you be willing to, maybe? No. Paul directs Timothy to essentially order the upper class in this church to change their perspective and their habits. No longer to rest their laurels in seats of privilege. They were to both give and do, not one or the other, but both. I remember two unnamed, quite wealthy couples who each briefly attended a church we once attended. At that time, I was a very busy young mother, but I was also the regional coordinator for Angel Tree, which was part, and is still, part of Chuck Colson's prison fellowship ministries. Each Christmas, this organization would coordinate Christians in the area, and other areas as well, through local churches, to purchase and deliver Christmas gifts to the children of prisoners on behalf of their inmate parent. This was a ministry of grace, mercy, and reconciliation. The gifts given were specifically chosen by the parent for his or her child. Volunteers would select as many parent-child couplings as they desired and then purchase, wrap, and personally deliver those gifts as a benevolent surrogate. Sharing in this way a token of love and restoration to a child separated from their parent in perhaps more ways than one. It was my understanding that the imprisoned parents had access to this ministry through in-person Bible study groups offered by the same organization. Because of this, Those volunteering for Prison Ministries Angel Tree often served on behalf of a brother or sister, fellow Christians, helping to sow seeds of reconciliation. Well, back to these two couples, and actually it was only the woman I interacted with in each case. But each one handed me a very large check and said, I'm donating the money and you can go get the gifts and make the deliveries for me. One of the two actually took her money back after I responded that I wished I could, but I was unable due to my own commitments to the program. I didn't have enough time. I believe neither couple remained active in our church long after that particular Christmas. So Paul commands, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and always ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And now we will move into Luke. We've heard the words of King David, we've heard the words of Paul, and now the words of Jesus spoken to a group of people, including disciples and, again, Pharisees, who were well known for their love of money and prestige. From Luke 16, 19 through 31, we heard the parable of the rich man and Lazarus today. But before we continue, we should be reminded that the previous parable in Luke 16 was that of the shrewd manager. This story is unlike what we're used to with Jesus' parables, for in it, all of the characters are wicked. There is no protagonist representing God or his kingdom. The two characters, the main characters, 
or a wealthy man with p many possessions and his stu steward who manages them, and they are equally unscrupulous. Well, this wealthy man decides to dismiss his steward for mismanagement of his assets. So the steward, after hearing this, goes out and makes a deal with the man's debtors, rewriting their invoices to significantly reduce each person's financial obligation to his master. Why did he do this? Well, the steward recognized the terrible position he was about to be in. Having been a lazy cheat, possessing no other skills or physical strength, and admittedly being too proud to beg, he realized he was about to become homeless. So to better his odds against homelessness, he decided to cheat his master again, buying friends who might feel obligated to take him in. And what did the master do when he caught wind of this? Well, here is, for us, a puzzling punchline. The master commends the steward for his shrewdness. Jesus went on to observe that people of this world are often more perceptive and discerning, more innovative in action, or shrewd than people of God's kingdom. He goes on to indicate that his followers should determine to use their worldly wealth for kingdom purposes so that when it runs out, and it will, friends have been made for eternity. And if you cannot be faithful with material wealth, which will, again, eventually run out, why would God entrust you with spiritual wealth, which has everlasting value? Clearly, you cannot live for both God and live for money. Well, the Pharisees and the crowd did not like hearing this at all, so Jesus debated with them, confirming that God's law stands firm that God sees straight into the heart, regardless of one's posturing or appearance or financial or social standing. While the likes of these Pharisees were resting in their smug sense of security, crowds of commoners were rushing into God's kingdom through repentant faith in the good news spoken by John the Baptist previously and Jesus. Pharisees who waived their religious and financial accomplishments would find out in the end they were sorely mistaken. Which leads us today to today's parable of the rich man and Lazarus. In this parable, Jesus describes a very wealthy man dressed like royalty, and he chose to dress himself like royalty, dining and reclining every day in his opulent home, but lying noticeably at the gate of his home was a very impoverished and diseased man named Lazarus. Lazarus longed to be fed by the scraps from this man's table, and he relied upon stray dogs to lick his festering wounds. Well, one day, Lazarus died, but so did the rich man. The angels, in God's mercy, carried Lazarus away to the blessed company of Abraham. But the rich man found himself in Hades. He looked up from his torment and could see way off who he thought was Abraham. And there, to his surprise, was Lazarus as well. He thought perhaps the rich man could summon some assistance. He thought that to himself. So he called to Abraham, by the way, that he did not call to God, which is interesting. He called to Abraham, said, hey, do you see me down here suffering? Have mercy on me and send Lazarus to come minister to me. What an audacious request. 
that Lazarus, finally experiencing the tenderness of care and restoration that he had longed for his whole life, that he should be instructed to leave all this to personally attend to a man who had refused to do the same for him? <laughs> Abraham explained this to, La to the rich man and added, besides, this chasm between us and you has been put here. It has been fixed so that neither of us can cross it. Well then, said the rich man, at least send Lazarus to my relatives' home to warn them so they won't come to this place of torment as well. Abraham responded firmly but gently, they have already been provided with Moses and the prophets, as were you, he might have thought. But Lazarus arising, but Lazarus arising from the dead to speak to them? That would be different, said the rich man. They would repent at that. You are mistaken, said Abraham. If they wouldn't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be persuaded by anyone risen from the dead. Jesus then turned to his disciples in the next few verses, if we were to continue reading, and explained the importance of rebuking those who place stumbling blocks in the way of God's children, such as the Pharisees in that context, but also forgiving them readily when they repent. So now for Amos, and I've included this in the manuscript for our reference. I'll read it. Woe to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to Hamath, and then go down to Gath and Philistia. Are they any better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? But you, you put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You, you who lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and on fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions. But... You do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. And by the ruin of Joseph, he means the, the, the state of Israel at that time, the division that was happening and how they were straying from God. This forceful declaration is addressed to the notable, the foremost people of Israel who feel extremely confident in themselves, incorrectly so. So God gives them a reality check. To do this, he first advises them to look at the conditions of surrounding nations, those governed by other gods, to realize how better off Israel, even in its divided state, is than these places by his grace and blessing. Even so, those of the kingdom, southern Judah and northern Israel, were living precariously. Utter disaster loomed for them on the horizon while they distracted themselves with luxurious living. After noting their passivity and describing their indulgences, the Lord declares, therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and your lounging will end. The sovereign Lord has sworn by himself. The Lord Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. God who gives abundantly expects of his chosen much in return. His blessings should not be considered something earned, entitled, flaunted, or wasted. Instead, they are to be stewarded 
in awareness and in wisdom for the sake of his kingdom. And there are consequences for neglect or abuse of his gifts. We often think of God's wrath resting upon those who don't know him. But consider Luke 12, 47 and 48. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. Again, the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten, but with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So, to quote another game show, we've come to the $65,000 question. What is today's password? If you're paying close attention, especially if you are the reader of this passage, maybe you noticed an omission from the Amos reading text that I just read. Amos 6.1 says, woe to you who are complacent in Zion and who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation. Complacent or complacency is the password. And it's defined as smug pleasure in oneself or in one's advantages and situation without awareness of personal deficiencies or of dangers that lurk around. How might we be sitting here today complacent? How might we be leaning into complacency? Does this message have any application for us? I don't have specific answers for all of us. And this is because the question applies to me as well, as an individual and as a member of our church. We must each and all note, importantly, that the questioner is not me, it is the Lord. Am I? Are you guilty of complacency? We who are richly blessed to be here, members of his kingdom, part of his family, with the many gifts he gives us, and particular, in particular, we are this local body of believers. Does complacency exist? Let's review the main points in closing from each reading as they are illuminated by our key word. From Psalm 146, considering who the Lord is, we should gratefully revere him with every fiber of our being for the entirety of our lives. Complacent worship, therefore, is not genuine. From 1 Timothy 6, we must guard the faith, demonstrating proper belief through a lifestyle transformed by the gospel. Complacency, though, focuses on the wrong treasures of God and therefore jeopardizes the faith. From Luke 16, the Lord has not been complacent toward us. He has sent us his word through the prophets and through Jesus Christ himself. What we do with this is of consequence. And from Amos 6, we who are blessed and entrusted stewards of God's kingdom are accountable for our attitudes, our activities, and inactivity. May we never be found complacent. Amen and amen. Please stand.
Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. God of mercy, you provide us with your holy word that we might know and believe in Christ. Make us diligent to study your word and dwell in your promises, that we are content with your provision in this, so that we are content with your provision in this life and joyfully look toward the life to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Holy God, remember the men to whom you have given the noble task of pastor especially the pastors of Grace Anglican Church, Recife, Brazil, and All Saints Church, Everett, Washington. Strengthen them that they might be above reproach as they care for their own households as well as your church. Preserve them from every snare of the devil and give them a great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear Lord, our prayer. prayer. Father in heaven, Preserve our homes from idols and sins of idleness. Bless fathers and mothers as they catechize their children, that generations to come might faithfully guard their hearts and rejoice in your gifts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. King of kings and Lord of lords, watch over the authorities of this and every nation. Deliver them from the idols of wealth and power and grant that they would use their offices in service to you and those you have entrusted to their care. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Almighty God, you afflict, you afflict in faithfulness and comfort in your steadfast love. Let your mercy come to Anderson, Barbara, Brenda, Brian, Chris, Dave, Dick, Ginny, Jay, Judy, Kelly, Kelly, Mac, Matt, Michael, Michael, Nevin, Pam, Paul, Regina, Theodore, Tom, and all in need of help that they might find their consolation in your promises until you deliver them from their trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, you have rescued us from our sin, and now you feed us sumptuously with your son's body and blood. Grant that all who receive this holy supper today would be preserved from hard-heartedness, clothed in Christ's righteousness, and comforted by your gifts of life and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. 
Heavenly Father, you deliver your people from the sufferings of this world and comfort them with eternal rest. Receive our thanks for your kindness to the saints who have gone before us and preserve us in, in repentance until we are carried by angels to Abraham's side. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Answer all doubt and fear, O Lord, with confidence in your word and sacraments, that by these means of grace we may be kept in holiness and guarded from temptation and despair until the day when you bring all things to their perfect fulfillment and we are delivered to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Together, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. In the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The peace of the Lord be always with you. All right, as the uh, sacred ointment is being passed, we now say this, offer to God, unto God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows 
unto the Most High. And we will sing. the doxology.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these tithes and offerings which are symbols of our life and labor. May they be used in your church for the good work you have set before us and for the furthering of your kingdom. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It is for us the body of Christ. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to offer, the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands. It is for us the blood of Christ. Pray, brethren, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept this sacrifice of your hands and praise the glory of his name for our good and the good of all his church. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it thankfully in remembrance of Jesus Christ our Lord, who in these holy mysteries gives us a pledge of eternal life and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Be present, be present, O Jesus, our great high priest, as you were present with your disciples and be known to us in the breaking of the bread who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. 
but we are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our Christian bodies are made clean by his body and our souls washed through his more precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please stand. And let us pray. Together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work that you have given us to do, to love and serve you as your faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Any announcements? If we could, uh, well, it's practically all a congregation, but if the mission committee would stick around after service, I'd appreciate it. And the Thanksgiving potluck is tentatively rescheduled to the 12th okay. of November instead of the 19th. Okay. Okay, um, uh, just what's on here basically, Synod is coming up. If you want to go, please register on the website, um, Parish Potluck on the 12th. Um, so there's been questions from folks, why do we change position when we, during the service? And so I was going to try to put something in the bulletin, and then I found a really great video online. Um, I shared the link in the video I sent, in the email I sent out this morning with the liturgy and all that sort of stuff. But also, it says here how to find it. It's just the title of it and Father Bryce. That's all you need, and it'll get right to it. It's a really great video on why we move when we move during a service. Um, and that's all. Oh, and the other thing is, um, Father Art used to put, if a saint or a martyr or whatever was on a specific Sunday, he would include that information on the liturgy. And when I have room, I'm going to be doing that. So today, it's Sergius. He was a monk and reformer in the Russian church, and there's a blurb about him on the back of our liturgy. So that's all. Okay, our recessional hymn is Trust and Obey. There is no other way. Remember that. told me there's no other way.
forth in the name of Christ. <laughs> 